Welcome back. Next, we're going to be learning about how to define our own functions in Q. So the most basic form of a function is just an empty curl E brackets, also known as lambda. So if we define this and then we run type on that variable f, if we look up 100h in our data types reference, we'll see 100 refers to lambda. So you can read more on lambda and function notation there. Um, so when we have no parameters to our function, we can call it with empty square brackets like this and we get nothing returned. Um, when we count that, we're just showing we get one returned. And then in this example, we're just showing this is returning the same thing as a generic null, um, which is um, signified here double colon. So functions that return no value, so like this, um, it's actually returning this generic null, so it's not returning nothing. Um, and then down here, we're just showing that you don't actually need to give a function a variable name in order to use it. So when we run f like this, and we have the same function here, and we're calling it with our square brackets, we're able to run it in the same way, and they're equivalent to each other. Okay, so fairly straightforward. Now let's introduce some parameters to the function. So we've defined our first parameter here, and this is the notation. We need to use square brackets at the beginning of the function, so inside the first curly bracket, and we put the parameter name. And then in this function, all we're doing is returning that input parameter. So if I define this and then I call my function f with one, you see it's just returning my input parameter. So if I have this as 100, you see that. And if I did something else here, like I added one to it, you'd see I get 101 returned instead. Then when I have two parameters, I simply just separate them with a semicolon. So in this example, I've got a numerator and denominator, so I'm just doing a simple division here. I've got the top value as my first parameter and then the bottom value as my second. And then in this example, I'm passing one parameter. So what's created here is a projection. So in order to get a value back, I need to pass a second parameter. So you see I get 0.5 returned when I divide one by two. And just note the order of these parameters is what determines which gets assigned to which. So the first one you pass in is going to be your first parameter here, numerator, and your second one, denominator, and so on. So we're just showing here a few different ways to call this function. So this is with our functional notation, and then this is using that projection we'd seen already. So um, you can see there that they're the same thing. Okay, so have a go with this exercise. So we're just asking you to define a function range that takes one parameter input, which is L, and um, we don't know what L is gonna look like, um, and it's not gonna do anything to that input. So we're, that's a very straightforward one. Have a go with that. And just to note on parameters, um, you can have up to eight defined here. Um, and when you want to pass more than eight, so say you've got nine or more, um, it's common practice to use a dictionary to do that. Um, so we'll be looking at um, that in our future module on dictionaries. Um, but for now, just note, um, you'd only be able to pass up to eight like this. Okay, let's get on and put some logic in our function next. So in order to add our function logic, we, we did see that above actually, this here would be an example of our function logic. Um, and then we're just extending that a bit further. And um, instead of having just the one expression, we have two. And you can see here, we split that over multiple lines. So in this example, we're doing a conversion from Fahrenheit to Celsius. So my input parameter is Fahrenheit. I'm defining a variable inside the function called offset. And then that's going to be the difference between Fahrenheit and Celsius. So I'm just reducing it by 32. And then I'm doing my multiplication here to do the, the um, calculation ratio that I need to convert it to Celsius. Um, so you can see here I've split this function up over multiple lines and what's returned is just one final output which is the result of this line. So I've split this over multiple lines and the important thing to note here to separate those multiple expressions I've used a semicolon. So I could have actually put this all on the one line for example and that would have returned the same thing down to, to personal preference there on, on that. But it is important to note um, when you have got multiple lines, if I try to do something like this, I'd get a parse error. So you must have at least one space there 
um, in front of all of your lines in a multi-line function. And the same goes for this closing curly bracket. If we had that right up against um, at, the, at the very first space here, we get a parse error. So you have to have at least one. And you, you've seen the way we had it there was it was tabbed in quite a lot. So that's down to personal preference. Um, how much you spacing you have in front, um, but at a minimum you need one space in front. Okay, have a go at this exercise. So we're just taking the function range we defined in the previous example, and we're gonna put some logic in it. And we want to calculate the range of numbers in the list. And our list would be this input here. And we wanna return 60. So we're saying the range is from minus 10 up to 50, and that equates to a range of 60. So have a go at that. And then once you're happy, let's move on and look at some of the rules around returning from a function. So we've seen here, we can simply have the expression on the final line and that will return the value of the function. Um, now, if we had added a semicolon here, we wouldn't get anything returned and that's it's suppressing the output. So we've seen that as well in our string manipulation module, the semicolon suppresses the output. Um, so if we didn't want to actually return anything from the function, we just wanted to do some calculations, we could use that. Um, and we could add a colon out in front of here to force it to return. So it's kind of effectively ignoring the suppression here. Um, probably more often you'd see this form, but these do the same thing and it's totally down to personal preference which one you choose. Um, we can also force an early return. So instead of having it here, um, we can have it up earlier in the function. Um, so we've got a few examples just to show that and, and to better illustrate it, we're going to add in a new line here, which is printing out a statement. So as we've seen in our string manipulation module again, this here standard out function is really useful when logging to just help see what's going on more clearly. So in example one, we're suppressing our output. So when we run this, we see we get the standard out or the, the printed statement returned, but we don't get this final expression and calculation returned because the semicolon is suppressing it. In example two, we're forcing the output to be returned. So you'll see we get our standard output printed statement, and then we also get our result returned from this calculation. In example three here, this is where we're doing our early force return. So we're actually going to force it to return from this very first line. So you'll see we get a different value returned and it's simply um, 70 minus 32. And then we don't even get to our printed statement or our final calculation because we've, we've said return early from this function here. And then in example four, we get our printed statement and our result return. So that's gonna give the same result as example two. So that's when we don't suppress the output and we don't need to force return it. So this is again, probably the most commonly used one. Um, again, the difference between these two um, has no impact on performance. It's just down to visual preference on, on which one looks better. Okay. So next let's take a new function. So we've called this function cap divide and we had our divide function above where we simply just divide the numerator by the denominator. In this function, we're going to introduce the concept of conditional evaluation for the first time. So to do that in Q, we can use if statements. So we can head over to our reference card and up to our keywords and over to if, and we can find out more about if here. Basically, if we'll evaluate the first statement um, and the result of that should be either 1B or 0B, so true or false. And depending on that, it will make a decision whether to evaluate what comes afterwards or not. So in my example here, I'm saying if my denominator that's inputted is zero, I'm gonna force an early return of 20f and then otherwise I'm going to calculate v which is going to be my numerator divided by de my denominator. So to show that I've got two examples here in one of them my denominator is 20 in the other my denominator is 0. So you can see here in this example it's doing the division 100 divided by 20 it's getting to this line and then the one above it's not it's jumping out here at 20f. So we could have actually done something very similar instead of using the if statement we could have used min. So in this example, I am always going to actually do this expression, so to do the division. But then after that happens, I'm only going to return the minimum of 20 and my result here. 
So in that way, I'm also capping it. So when I run this, you'll see I get the same result returned. So when I do a calculation where the result is less than 20, I'm going to get 20 returned. Okay, so there's usually many ways to achieve the same thing is the point here. Um, and we're just showing a quick, quick flavor of some. So we have another exercise here. So taking the range function again, um, we just want you to edit it so that we are using the force return instead. Okay, so we've already seen this first one in action. We know we can use functional notation. So we're, we're creating a lambda here and we're passing in three. And in this example, um, it's the same function. We're just calling it square, giving it a variable name. So if we had four as our input to both, we'd get the same result. So this is our functional notation here. Um, so one way in which our user-defined functions differ to those of the native functions in Q is that we're not able to use infix notation with the user-defined functions. So we know with our infix notation, that basically means the um, operator goes in between. So you can remember the word infix and in between. Um, so we can do stuff like this. We can have a pra one parameter on the left and then the operator and then the other parameter on the right. We can also use functional notation with our inbuilt functions. This is eliding the first argument to pass the second. So instead of passing three directly here, we're just passing it outside the square brackets here. For this example, we're projecting over the first argument and then calling with the second explicitly. Um, and then this one here, we're projecting over the first argument and then applying um, implicitly this value of five. So don't worry too much about those. We're just showing that we have a good few ways to, to apply our inbuilt functions in Q. Um, and then the point here is that we are not able to do this last line here. So when we have our function notation, we can do all of these ones with our square brackets. Again, they're all fine. But when we get to our last line, we get the type error here. So we can't do this. Even though they're both division, this is our user defined one and we must use a form of functional notation. Okay, so we just have a short reminder here on the number of input parameters to the function. So when we've got too many arguments, we get a rank error, and when we have less arguments than is required, we get a projection. So we've got two exercises here. First one here, create a function with three parameters, x, y, and z. And we want you to return logic that's um, adding x plus y and then multiplying the result by z. And then in the last exercise here, create a function that produces n random integers between 0 to 100, where n is a parameter. So something that you covered in the list module might help you here. So as a hint, um, if we go back to our overloaded glyphs page and the question mark, something here might help you with that one. Okay, so I'll see you in the next video.